panel discussion. It's great to be with all of you here today. So, incubation is a really broad term, right? It's a single word that covers a large range of support, uh, ranging from access to finance, to introductions to networks for mentorship, coaching, and also matching with human resources. And a growing group of incubators across India are finding various ways to identify, nurture, and accelerate social enterprises from idea stage to proof of concept to being ready to convert financial investment into scale and sustain social impact. And new stakeholders are joining in, such as educational institutions, corporate houses, philanthropists, and various others are also starting to support social enterprises in various ways. So have we thought about what is really working, what needs improvement, and what and what are the, some of the new areas in which partnerships between traditional incubators and others could especially be productive? This session will, uh, will explore this. It, it will also explore the opportunities for collaboration between Indian corporations and incubators in building up the pipeline of investment-ready social enterprises. It will also address two broad topics. Firstly, what are some of the major challenges that investors see affecting the enterprise pipeline? And second, what kinds of resources, financial, human, experiential, that corporations and incubators can jointly bring to the table to help overcome these challenges? So without further ado, let me introduce you to PR Ganpati, CEO uh, of Wilgro Foundation. He's also fondly known as Guns. And uh, on the panel, we have Harsha Angeri uh, from Bosch, Nirankar Saxena of Fiki, Pamela Rusos of GSBI, and Rema Subramaniam of Ankur Capital. Over to you, Gans. Thanks a lot. Get my mic working? OK, great, super. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, all of you, for joining us. Quite an exciting topic. I think we've reached a certain stage in the evolution of the incubation function. Uh, there have been experiences and successes of supporting entrepreneurs through the early stages of, these jo of this journey. And a lot of that has been done using philanthropic capital, has been done using funds from programs such as the government's, uh, the TDB of the Government of India's programs. But as we reach a point where we need to scale, we have to support these entrepreneurs in their growth, there is really no uh, deep pool of resources, both in terms of talent, laboratories, uh, financial resources, access to markets, and so on and so forth, as the corporate sector. And so the corporate sector some enterprises are beginning to show an interest in these early stage social enterprises. They are recognizing that they have a role to play in the success of these enterprises. But at the same time, there are some challenges, there are some kinks that need to be ironed out. And this is an interesting space that's beginning to take off. This panel is therefore extremely timely. And we've assembled for the all-rounded nature of the discussion a group of diverse points of view. Rama here represents the investor's point of view and she will speak to some of the concerns as well as the opportunities that investors may see in the collaboration between corporates and early state social enterprises and incubators. Harsha, uh, through the work at Bosch, actually represents one of those corporates that's doing some really yeoman work in the field of supporting entrepreneurs and will speak to his experience not just in India but go Bosch does this globally. Nirankar uh, from Fiki will be representing really the voice of industry as industry thinks of the social enterprise movement and how it wishes to engage. Pamela, uh, with her role in the strategic alliances function of you know, the world's oldest and most respected incubator, the GSBI, will bring a global perspective to this discussion and tell us what's worked in other countries and what's, what have been some of the pitfalls that we should avoid when we in India look at tying incubators more closely into corporates and getting corporate uh, buy-in. I'd love for you all to join the discussion at some point, so we'll save a considerable amount of time for questions so that we can make this discussion interactive. I do see that we have some entrepreneurs in the room, and so we'd love to hear your perspectives. But if you don't speak up, then I will represent your voice on this. <coughs> so without that, I'd like to pass it on to the panel, have each one of them maybe uh, say a set of opening remarks on what they feel uh, are some of the opportunities and the challenges in the area of collaboration between corporates, social enterprises, and incubators. And maybe we'll start with Nirankar and then we'll Thank you, Ganpati. My name is Narinkar Saxena. I am Senior Director at FIKI. A uh, very important session for social impact. Incubation, the new stakeholders, and the strategies. Dear friends, I'd like to 
uh, throw a dice on you and an opportunity both. You know our country, uh, two years back, uh, we have a wonderful secretary to Ministry for Corporate Affairs, Mr. D.K. Mittal. And we had a part of the consultative committee. We requested Mr. Mittal that we are there. He was writing the bill for the corporate social responsibility. And we impress on him that you please allow corporate to invest in incubation centers. Happy to inform you that this bill has been passed with the factor that in India, any corporate who would like to avail the CSR credit under the policy can invest in any incubation center. The only rider right now, which it will remove by the time, is the incubation center has to be approved by the ministry or Ministry of Science and Technology or any government of India. No problems. So what is happening? That $5 billion worth of corpus corporate is going to have, which they will look avenues to invest. And in our sense, this is a big opportunity, a sensible opportunity for corporate to invest in incubation centers with the stakeholders, with private institutions, because the incubation centers are public and private owned. So I encourage and we from FIKI will encourage corporate to, to look this as a new area of investment in the social sector. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Pamela Russo, Director of Strategic Alliances at the GSBI, the Global Social Benefit Institute. And as Guns mentioned, we've been around for over 10 years um, and working with uh, social entrepreneurs around the world where over a quarter of them, of the over 200 that we've worked with, are based here in India. And um, we are run out of Santa Clara University, so right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And so, and our focus is really around business models and helping social entrepreneurs really figure out their business model, how they can uh, create sustainable and scalable businesses. And so we work a lot with, uh, with corporations um, in, in Silicon Valley, but then around the world, um, helping um, our social entrepreneurs in a variety of ways. Um, of course, you know, when you ask a, a social entrepreneur what, what, is, what do they need the most, number one is funding. And number two is talent. And we see those uh, um, corporations as being a really great place to get both of those. Um, but there's some other ways, too, that, um, that we can share. I'd be happy to share in terms of, of, of how we've worked with corporations and how we see um, across the world um, uh, some of our social entrepreneurs working successfully with, uh, with corporations. Thank you. Uh, you were... OK, I'm I'm the head of strategy m and and all the new businesses that Bosch is getting into. So the summary of the introduction that Gunst made was that the gun is pointing at me. So I'm the corporate uh, uh, guy on the, the stage here. So quick introduction, we are about 54 billion euros globally, German headquartered in India. We do about 2 billion euros. That's kind of the scale of activities. Uh, so the reason why we are here is, uh, as an organization, we said we've got to build new businesses, completely new businesses focused on mid and bottom of the pyramid markets uh, for India, from India. But the fundamental approach has been that let's be patriotic about the problem, but not about the solution. So that's the theme I will use uh, throughout the conversation. So let's solve the problem for India, but not necessarily get stuck in this mindset that the solution has to come from India. Why does it need to? So that's kind of where uh, we come from. So we work with a lot of uh, social enterprises, startups, technology organizations, but our approach is can we solve the problem? And also can it be solved at a particular scale? And we can talk about why we need to solve it at a particular uh, level, if you will. So in the incubation landscape, we actually see our role at the two ends of the incubation pipeline. One, in terms of helping the incubation itself, identifying these uh, new innovations and seeing how they uh, mature in the process. And the second and the other end of the pipeline as an acquirer, we also look at buying out companies. So we sit kind of at both ends of the uh, pipeline, if you will. So that's kind of where I come from. Uh, I'm Rama from Angkor Capital. Uh, we uh, are somewhere in the, in the value chain between uh, incubator and the regular VCs. Uh, we believe that uh, all the companies, like you know, they said, talent was one major <coughs> trait. Uh, the what we think is that the talent by itself cannot be 
cannot solve the problem unless you have vested professionals in the whole ecosystem. And uh, that's where we think corporates and professionals can play a significant role in bridging the gap between what an incubator uh, uh, provides and what the VC's world and what the regular financial world expect an organization to be before they would come in with their capital. And at the initial stages, these companies require a lot of hands-on professional support. And that is not by just talent which is employed talent, it would need to be a lot more than that. And that's where I think corporates uh, would play a significant role. Though there have been, in yesterday's uh, one of the sessions, there were doubts raised as to how corporates can play a role. Uh, maybe more of that will come up in the session later on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, I think one way we can move this discussion forward is maybe break it down into some of these elements of uh, collaboration and then look at each one in, in a little more detail. And perhaps, you know, we can take the talent one first. Uh, we face at some level a uh, dearth of entrepreneurs and there are corporates in India that have worked with programs such as Teach for India have opened up their employee pool to such programs to be able to, for employees to take sabbaticals off to go and teach for a couple of years. Uh, and so potentially corporates could provide a pool of human resources, a potential budding social entrepreneurs. They could provide mentors, they could provide volunteer talent, they could provide experienced talent in research and development and engineering space. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts and what you see as some of the opportunities and challenges uh, for collaboration between incubators, social enterprises, and corporates, especially with respect to the talent dimension, either full-time, part-time, mentoring, and so on and so forth. And Yes, I think, uh, so there are multiple pieces to this question. So it's very hard to just take the pure talent dimensions. I would kind of broaden it to say capability. So what capabilities can be brought to solve a particular problem? So from that perspective, yes, I think we have, we see ourselves having two roles. So one is, as I said, bring to bear some of our core capabilities to solve a particular uh, problem. So for example, for us, manufacturing is a significant capability. Over Between last year and this year, we are investing about 700 million euros in manufacturing capacity in India. So that's a significant manufacturing capability that is getting uh, built up uh, within the region, if you will, with you know, automated equipment, all that kind of stuff. So one is, how do we bring capability uh, within sectors like this? So it could be in manufacturing, it could be in R&D, that can be brought to bear to solve the problem. The second aspect is, how do you build an ecosystem around this? So this is where a lot of uh, work that we do, which is not directly core, if you will, to us, because it's not manufacturing a certain product, is skill development programs. So we fund a lot of activities around vocational skills development and so on, but around our competency area. So it's not kind of uh, completely tangential to what we normally are doing. So it is again around engineering, but not necessarily our industry. It could be some other industry. <laughs> how do you develop talent that can be used by somebody else, but who the know-how comes from us in terms of how do you train these uh, people. So I see the role in as capability more than specific talent, but R&D manufacturing, but also in activities like skill development. So I, I like the broadening of capabilities. Um, a couple of thoughts. One is that, so one of the things that uh, we do at GSBI is, is um, uh, mentoring. And, um, and then that is actually what we all often think of as our secret sauce. And our mentors are Silicon Valley execs. Uh, actually, I've been a mentor I've, I've, uh, for over six years. And I've started software companies, and I've, I've run them, and, and I've sat in too many VCs' offices asking for money. <laughs> and um, and so those, that's the kind of uh, capability that we bring to our social entrepreneurs. And so, and what are, I mean, these are all, so, like I said, Silicon Valley execs. They're coming for corporations. They've got that deep expertise about having built and run businesses, having gone to ask for money, having had the successes and the failures, and being able to draw on that to give that that wisdom, that learning to our social entrepreneurs. And, um, and time and time again, we hear that that's just an invaluable resource uh, for, our, uh, for social entrepreneurs. Um, so we, we work closely with, with um, our, our corporate partners and, and beyond to be able to, um, to get that skill set. And you know, some of it are some, um, you know, some as not um, as, as 
senior as, as some of them. We often bring in like junior mentors and such so that they can learn alongside some of our senior mentors. So we kind of have a, a mentoring, the mentoring uh, process too, which kind of brings some more additional skills uh, from, from corporations in there. Um, to talk about your, uh, uh, your capability, we just um, hosted about um, a month or so ago with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, with the Lemelson Foundation, who's here, um, and with Andy, who's um, also here uh, today and at the conference, um, a day-long um, discussion around hardware-based innovation. And there was a lot of discussion around in, in the local markets, you know, that, that, that local entrepreneurs need manufacturing capabilities that they can't, you know, get all the, and I don't know anything about machines and all that stuff, but, you know, the, the equipment that they need to be able to, um, to, uh, to uh, um, build and innovate what they're trying to do. And so, you know, really kind of focusing on and corporations having that as, as something. And, and so that's another st a strong way that, that social entrepreneurs can really um, get value from, from uh, the corporations and talent. Great. So I, and I'd like you to specifically address one. So we have companies like Deutsche Bank, for example, that has a, an alliance with, say, the B Fund where Deutsche Bank executives are required to spend n number of weekends mentoring social enterprises. Uh, so in your answer, if you can think about how such systematic programs can be set up by which corporates actually make available their people so that it's not an anecdotal volunteer sort of based system, but it really more drives the systemic flow of you know, access to that capability that the corporate has. And how can we keep, you know, at some level as an industry body, facilitate some of that? Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. See, what we see from the corporate side, uh, incubation sector is a business opportunity for them. I'll give you a live case study of Indian corporate. There's an Indian corporate uh, listed in national stock exchange called Jyoti Laboratories Limited, a 5,000 crore company. We, they are part of our executive committee. I am helping them. So they told us, no, we want to become a first leading FMCG company of India. How do we expand? So we have given a very unique modeling to them, which they are implementing. Is, as you rightly said, is all about the people's game. Talent is very, very important. How to find the right talent across for your businesses? So what, what Jyoti is trying to do is, Jyoti is going to set up and identify a incentive program in 600 districts in India. And they're going to find a entrepreneur or a incubator in each district and fund them with some incentive. Fund them as a grant. An initial grant would be around five to 10 lakh based on the businesses in 600 districts. And the business plan is that out of 600 districts on these investment, in the incubation or in the social space to pick up 25, 30 big enterprise in the mainstream businesses. So I think the corporates are learning in India. They have already started rolling the program in their own business interest. And now with the government policy on board, they can utilize their own funding on their CSR and their own business mandate. This is called inclusive growth for the corporate. This is a new dimension which India will replicate after successful case studies shown in the market. It will catch as a fire. So I think uh, uh, we are going in the right direction. And they, we have corporates on the other side which are running an open innovation program uh, just to keep a, uh, their market uh, stakeholders sensitized with some incentives. So open innovation programs and business line innovation programs for corporate will go a long way. So, <clears throat> this discussion is far uh, too calm for me to let it continue. So I'm going to stoke the fires a little bit uh, because of the, the point that you made. So while there is a, you know, a lot of value to a corporate specific uh, challenge or a call, and the fact that, that corporate is interested in those enterprises and there's therefore an exit, I'm sure that for an investor represents a serious concern for you because it's the big bear hub, uh, you know, to use a different analogy to illustrate the same point. So what would be some of your concerns and then we can talk about how potentially structures could be created that could alleviate those concerns when you're looking at corporate supporting 
Yeah, so uh, I would just also like to just add to what he just said is that what he said was really nice to hear this one thing because it goes back to how businesses have always expanded in India, not just in the recent past maybe where it has been service industry where you've not found that kind of support. But in the past when it was a Birla or Tata who was setting it up, that's how they would go about setting it up and small businesses that they would acquire. But the challenge would come in is if there are independent entrepreneurs who would want to do things. Or if you would want to do things which does not always 100% roll on to what the goals of the company is. Then that's where the, the challenge comes in. So at two levels the challenge comes in. One is for the organization itself, there would, may not be misalignment with what the entrepreneur wants to do, is one. Um, it's because there it's always profit, bottom line, is what the issue would be. Second is even from talent from the companies which would need to be assigned, it's just a KRA for them. So it's unless it's a, sorry, I would actually say unless it's a specific KRA is developed in such a way like in Deutsche Bank where you said that you know they would need to support and there's some evaluation parameters. An employee just considers this as if it's just something that they would need to do it. They may not have it the same way that they would do their own job. So it just becomes some add-on things that they would need to take off, which may or may not necessarily add value. And that's what we have seen that in most, unlike the GSBI, where I have been involved with uh, the mentoring program, in India, most of the mentoring programs that you see have not been as successful. Because there's always, a, you know, one within the company when they are aligned as well, because DBS as well, I've seen some mentors work and some not work. It's up to the individual then. But the corporates have still not incorporated that as part of their KRAs in a measurable manner or drive that behavior in a particular manner. So it's just left to individuals and most of the others come in with, and first of all in companies as employees, you're used to seeing things from a 30,000 feet level or operational level versus a startup who has a different mindset completely. And 95% of the employees in an organization don't have the entrepreneur mindset. They are interested in coming in, working, doing their job and moving out. And that's a misalignment that I see in wherever there's been a corporate and, uh, uh, and an entrepreneur uh, you know, um, matching that has happened. Invariably, like, you know, the typical employee just doesn't understand why an entrepreneur is going through this. I mean, I, mean, I have been on both sides of the fence and I know as an employee I don't realize that everything is set. I just have to pick up a call and tell the telephone operator to book a ticket maybe. Versus saying that if I have to do it, what does it involve and how does it involve? That mismatch is so high that incubators, when, when you see small companies and you try to pair them with large corporates, there's a big uh, gap. Yeah. Yeah. But the only thing is that in Bosch, it's because it's internal to them. It's not an external entrepreneur. Right. <laughs> so well, it's the issue that would come in as... You do support external entrepreneurs yes. and I'd love to hear the mechanisms yeah, that you have by which you know, talent engages with these, is it voluntary, is it mandatory, or how has it worked in, in Bosch? Sorry, first of all, we need to clarify that I think there are two streams of thought going here. So one is the CSR thought around which there is a 2% uh, rule where the question about voluntary versus, you know, all those activities are there. So the second is that as a corporate, we want to build some businesses. Right? So it is, for example, I head business development and I am here because my KRA is to build those businesses. If I don't build it, I lose my job. It's fairly clear. So I am not representing the CSR arm of the organization, which is a significant, I mean, I already told you we are 2 billion euro, you can run the match, we are listed organization, you can run the match, significant amount of money that has to be uh, put up. But in the other aspect that we talked about, where the KRA is very, very clear, that you know we have to build these uh, businesses. There I feel uh, with the entrepreneurs uh, there's a lot of alignment in terms of saying that okay we've got to solve this uh, problem and uh, we will put the best talent, we will put the best technologies. Where I've seen a conflict in this uh, whole role is sometimes it becomes competitive and sometimes we actually once we are in the field and we start experimenting out there is divergence of thoughts. And I have run into those issues. So where we say a product has to be a certain form factor, the entrepreneur has spent his life building something else. There is a clear divergence and we take a call that no, we cannot move forward 
and those are the kind of conflict situations we see. Second is competitive because at some point in time we are in it and we realize that let's say for example uh, one of the biggest issues we have found uh, because we are a technology organization so wherever we intervene working with entrepreneurs is where there is a technology or a product. So our approach when it comes to incubation is kind of reverse. If you see a typical innovation pipeline, you start with an idea, build it up and put it out in the field and commercialize it. So we kind of come the other way around. So what we say is if somebody, if there is a problem, as I said, let's figure out how do we solve the problem. So if there is an entrepreneur with a product, we go to him and say that give me your product. If you are trying two business models, I will try 10 and I will fund you for that. So let's throw this product in the field, test out multiple models, figure out where it is sustainable, where it works, where it can be scaled and also we figure out how we can intervene, should we add technology or what needs to change. And then we kind of come back and say what should we do here, so it's kind of going the reverse way. So there sometimes conflict happens because we throw it in the field and it doesn't work. So one of the biggest issues we have found is of product quality and reliability, huge issue. Across enterprises we have seen that there are products that are being built, social enterprises put out in the field. But if we have to own it as Bosch, we cannot put our brand on it. There is no way. That is a conflict situation. Where we say, no, we cannot put this. It works, the model is sustainable, but we cannot put our brand on it. So that is where the conflict starts happening. But have you seen examples of conflicts and do you have some best practices perhaps over time that you've evolved and how some of those can be minimized? Do you have situations where mentors come from the same industry uh, as the startups they're mentoring and therefore potentially there is a fear that <coughs> some of those ideas could uh, you know, cross the Chinese barrier, Chinese wall and, and uh, find their way into hands they shouldn't have? Um, so I don't recall any. I, I don't see that. Um, now, you, you know, most of our mentors, for instance, are in the technology industries and um, or in the in the semiconductors, and most of our social entrepreneurs aren't in those fields. Um, so, so we don't see that competitive um, piece. But, but a question. I mean. You know, I understand the quality, you know, the, and, and, you know, social entrepreneurs are putting together products on shoestring budgets. And so, you know, how can a, a Bosch or some other organization expect to see the same level of quality that you would put, your own engineers would put into, into a product? So isn't that a, a place where you can, you can uh, partner with them and strengthen their quality and, and see that as, because, you know, like I said, having the same expectations um, feels like that's unrealistic for social entrepreneurs who just don't have the wherewithal. Sure, so I think the expectation, when I say quality or reliability, is not about, uh, you know, being at, let's say, I mean, I would use the word global benchmark or something. So it is about, is it the right technology? Mm -hmm. So I don't think being an entrepreneur, you can afford to take a wrong technology decision, right? So that doesn't require a corporate, so say, to keep it simple, if you take uh, water filtration, lot of Indian entrepreneurs' decision is around RO, which we feel for Indian energy deficit, water deficit country is a challenge because RO is 70% of the water and requires a lot more energy than, let's say, ultra filtration. So that, to take that decision or that investment decision, you don't need to have a corporate R&D department, right? right? But, so, but that is where the point of conflict kind of comes. So it's not about having not the capability to build a world-class product or with all the certifications on. So those interventions can always happen. But this intervention is where the challenge is. This is a question for you is a uh, point that Harsha raised, which is the CSR versus the strategic. And the ideal situation perhaps is where it's CSR and strategic, which is a GE Healthcare is funding medtech startups that are working with, you know, in rural areas, but it's doing it using CSR budgets and but also providing some of the corporate support. Are these mechanisms possible? How do how does Fiki membership view you know, CSR versus strategic, are they thinking strategically about CSR? Uh, see, as far as uh, corporate social responsibility goes, so it has multiple stake in that. One is on uh, philanthropy, social impact, and sustainability. In our opinion, every st stake is very, very important. In certain cases where you can't make uh, impact sustainable, 
it has to be on a grant basis. For example, the education to um, maybe to a girl child. But majority of corporates today thinking to invest in sustainable businesses in social impact. They want to see their investment to grow for economic development. So I think it's a, uh, and it depends on the corporate board to decide. Our suggestion would be to see, invest more, where you can create more businesses for sustainability. Right, but do you recommend that they start looking in areas of their strength? Like for example, a Tata Steel could do education or a Tata Steel could fund energy efficiency ideas that improve efficiency in the plant. And see, so ultimately so corporate bottom line is the balance sheet and, the, and their you know, stake uh, shareholders. So the corporate, they have to in work in the interest of the shareholder. So they would like to invest in their own line of businesses where they can see new ideas coming in. And if those ideas can be, can be come in the main business process. And, I li and uh, let me tell you that uh, the, uh, the point you have raised is to look the problem and then go backward integration is the right model. We should, they know what your customers are looking in. We have to learn from PNG. PNG is run, running a global innovation program, open innovation program. They pose a problem and then work backward integration. So many Indian corporates will learn that and they will try to see what is the best possible, uh, an ideal situation would be the solutions for them and they would like to invest in those areas. So Rama, question back to you is on this engagement with corporates on the strategic side. As an investor, would you be more concerned, less concerned? Is the way to you know, manage that risk? So if a GE for healthcare funded a med tech company that you've invested in, would that reduce that company's chances of you know, getting the best realization for its, uh, when it sells out and, and an exit? Or how does that dynamic work and how do you look at it as an investor? So the alignment has to be very, very clear. So the, uh, you know, when it's coming out like a CSR thing, then there's always a chance that there could be a misalignment. Versus that, so if I was funding a company which could potentially become a subset of a larger corporate, I might be less concerned about it. Because I think that, you know, somewhere that's the end, I, it, it belongs to them and they are driving it in a particular manner. And if the alignment of the fact that it's going to address a particular, sorry, and if it's going to address a particular uh, problem, and that's a problem that we see as an impact and that's aligned, I think that would not be so much of a concern. Uh, but a concern would come more from wherever it is a CSR, where it's seen as an external thing, because then it just becomes a tick mark. So the mission alignment could always go haywire. And that would be a concern. And uh, whether it is a company's involvement in terms of money, as well as talent. I think even the talent within the company, if for example it's a med medical instrument which Harsha is looking into, it's Harsha's KRA. So he would ensure that it would succeed. Whereas if it was a CSR, he has to do something. Uh, it's, it's something that's an add-on. Uh, his perspective to that would be completely different. So if it's, a, if it's something that's plugging into their ecosystem directly into their bottom line somewhere in the future, then I would be more comfortable. But if it's a CSR, we would be less, because then the company only looks at it as a, you know, as a donation for, for them to do it. It feel good factor is there, but doesn't drive efficiencies within the organization. Interesting, I would have expected the reverse perspective. Yes, please. Uh, one critical, I think, uh, issue which I'd like to raise to all stakeholders here is for any success on incubation, uh, what we have seen in India and worldwide, design is very, very important. Packaging, packaging your product, your services, your business solution, that is the gray area for most of the you know, startup companies and incubators. So uh, from the government and from the corporate side, we started the India Design Council, which is led by Ministry of Commerce. Anand Mahindra is the chairman from the, from the corporate side. He's, he's, he will be setting up a design centers in India. And these design centers will be a public-private partnership where you can, any startup, whether it's a social startup or a technology startup or any, they can go and utilize expertise of uh, various stakeholders. And such a 
in India, if you want to see this factor going up, we need to focus on the core issues of design, which will give a great impetus to our success to the startups. So another aspect of uh, that corporates have strong muscle in, which is you know something that social startups really struggle with, the access to markets. And Pamela, do you have any examples where some of the companies that went through GSBI have leveraged corporates for access to markets? And is that an area that potentially, and I'd love Harsha and, and uh, Nirankar's uh, perspective on this, that where corporates can help social startups? Definitely. Um, I'm just thinking of a, a couple of examples that, um, and also, you know, again, aligning with the needs and, and the business drivers of corporates and looking at that and being able to uh, feed into that system, if you will. Um, one example that I'm thinking of is um, an organization that's based in Nairobi uh, training slum youth, um, giving them sales and marketing skills. And, um, and you know, as a first um, job, they're they're selling socially responsible products, clean cook stoves, and and, and um, solar lighting into their communities. But they're also partnering with organizations like Safaricom and others that need a lot of talent around sales and marketing. And so then they can use basically the skills that they're they're training their youth for, and using kind of funneling those into the into these corporations that need that that kind of skill set. So, you know, for the social entrepreneurs in the, off, in the room here is, is thinking about how you can, you know, fit, again, aligning with their business needs, that's what you're hearing, would definitely need to do that. And then what kinds of things do they need in order to uh, funnel in, into that and be a part of, of their ecosystem? So what they, what they were trying to question is that, so when, um, was this an added responsibility to the sales team or it was part of their core responsibility? Uh, into whose sales team? So, so they're just basically, they're doing skill development around sales and marketing skills. And Safaricom has got, I mean, if you go to Nairobi, there's like tons of Safaricom little kiosk stores, right? And so they need people, young, young talent, to be out there selling the Safaricom services. And so uh, rather than Safaricom having a, a, a training center and trying to t teach that, um, and, and they don't, and so they have a lot of fallout um, for the, you know, the people that they're, the, the youth that they're hiring for these kiosks, they're partnering with, um, with this organization um, um, to, to basically use, that, use them as a, a training vehicle, if you will. So, so Arsha, obviously, you know, you've, you've said you'd hate to put a product that wasn't at Bosch standard through your channels, but are there ways in which one, you know, your, your market access channels could be tapped by social startups in, uh, for testing products? So again, uh, there's no a kind of magic bullet answer because uh, distribution or getting access to market in India is an extremely complicated problem. And frankly speaking, I think we struggle as much as any social enterprise, especially in the new forest that we are doing, which is absolutely new for us. Mm -hmm. And the reality is distribution channels don't exist, right? So you have to literally uh, start from scratch. I think the advantage we have is that, uh, uh, of course, the FMCG companies like Unilever, PNG, have done an amazing job in getting this access to market. So amongst industrial conglomerates, as I would classify us, the guys who make the boxes, if you will, uh, we have done a fairly good job uh, I mean, in terms of uh, using entrepreneurs, building, making them build, for example, we have the largest privately held car service network in the country, about 4,500 outlets. It has been built grounds up, literally. Right? But it has taken years, so it's again a uh, hard uh, thing. So when we work in that space, we are in a position to offer that. So we work with a lot of small companies, I and mean, that's not really a social uh, space, but just to give you a flavor, we do work with them, take their products, and it goes through our uh, system. But on the flip side, in this space, we do not have the channels. So we are not on par with anybody else. We are you know, also struggling there. So from an incubation perspective, I think one of the things that I have been talking to a lot of them is that don't, I mean, also incubate a lot of distribution models because I think as a country we are really lacking those. I mean, there's a lot of innovations that are getting incubated, but distribution is not getting incubated. But direct channels, we give access. Just to give you a perspective, the medical product that we have put out in the market, it has a European startup, uh, actually two European startups, one from Scandinavia, one from Germany, one from, and the third startup is from Chennai. So we have pulled it together and put this product out. Within two months, uh, the annual volume that the startups had done cumulatively, we have already given them orders. 
So that's the magnitude of scale effects that a big corporate can bring in, right? So cumulative volume that they had done in two months of launch, we have already been able to uh, give them. So which is pretty uh, significant because we can open direct channels pretty well. So direct is something even in these new forests we can provide access. Distribution channels, I think we are also trying to build. So there's no choice there. Access to markets dimension. Oh, I totally. I agree with him, you know, this is the challenge. Distribution is a key challenge. Uh, the other challenges are the talent and the mentors for startups. So three major challenges uh, any startup will have. A good talent, a good mentors. Mentors is very, very important to give you right directions. And then on social impact, definitely distribution. So I think uh, uh, we still in the our corporates are still learning. They have to s learn from already examples set up by other corporations in the world. And they're open to learn that. Uh, I want to also make the statement that India will be the future platform for the world corporation to invest in the incubation space. Because India and China together is the 45% of social impact in the world. Asia is 70%. So majority of the investments in the social space is going to come from major corporations all over the world, and India is a hotbed. I think we'll uh, open it up for questions now. We have about half an hour, 40 minutes left. Uh, so please identify yourself and your organization affiliation, and then if you're directing the question to anybody specifically, then just please mention who you'd like to. My experience has been that uh, in the guise of in incubation or uh, trying to promote small enterprises, many times it's the large enterprises who transfer their problem to the small enterprise. You take the auto sector as a good example. Today there are very few medium, micro, small, medium enterprises surviving. It's become a big boy's play because of reasons of investment in the machinery, land, etc. Also the working capital. So actually in many times what happens is I, I think under this guise of incubation or whatever else you want to call it, it's a transfer of a problem rather than an owning of responsibility. The second thing is there are two important stakeholders who are missing here, which is the banking system and the government. So I think the conversation also, ha and the third is the education system, which is what ki kind of helps countries like the US significantly in, in you know, creating new social enterprises. Actually, what Chandu brought up was uh, been my experience with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, um, companies have, so, have also said that, you know, they have social organizations because they are creating f smaller uh, supply chain organizations. But what they don't support with is the supply chain, is the working capital that will be needed. So if you are a rug manufacturing company, for example, if you were to go out and do manufacture rugs and you have to employ 10,000 people to do that, you would be paying them the salaries, you would be ensuring that you, you would have maybe a six months before you realize the value. Now a lot of companies, as part of their social responsibility or whatever, they do is that they set up these smaller companies. The entrepreneur is supposed to run that. So what happens is now the working capital problem is transferred to the smaller player. So that has happened in many of these cases, that, that has happened in the last decade, decade and a half, that smaller companies are coming up which are facing working capital problems. The financial system is still not ready to support them, and that is becoming a bottleneck as well. And uh, uh, you know, the, the um, part where, is it, sorry, is it part of you know, your own, when it becomes part of your own uh, um, 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 you know, vertical, uh, you know, your SBU, then you would look at it as a fact, can I, you know, how do I save costs? Then there is an inherent conflict that comes into that picture, is one thing. Versus when you are looking at an external company, which then becomes more like a CSR and the support goes down. There was one statement I was telling you, like uh, yesterday is one of, the, one of the other panel sessions that was happening. They said invariably when the social enterprise and uh, the large corporate uh, uh, are put together, it's like a hare and an elephant mating because you know, one of them gets, you know who gets hurt in that manner. <laughs> There's a question here. Yeah. 
Um, Maybe no, I think the issues are valid. So maybe one response to that is uh, because from a distance it always uh, sometimes you feel like that. But I think we need to understand how the industry works. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. There is something called global platforms and local platforms. If you're in the airline industry, you will not build a personalized cockpit for India. There is one cockpit that will get built by Boeing and that's the one that will work across the world. But if you are in, let's say, some other uh, industry, you will localize your products. So the whole supply chain, frankly speaking, is reflective of that, right? So for example, if you take our own uh, different uh, industries, if you take something like security, you know, the watch security system that you see, most of the metro networks in this country has watch security systems. We only make the product. <laughs> Right? So all the distribution, the system integration are done by small enterprises whom we have built over a period of time. So, but the product is still there. So if you go and look into the product ecosystem, are there people who are manufacturing the products within India? You will not find. I will give you the answer. But if you go and see around the boss product, security product, which is going into all these kind of systems, are there a lot of smaller enterprises that have come up and built, are winning large orders because Winning a metro order is no small deal. They front end, we don't front end, but we certify them, we give them the product, we give them all the training and technology capability. You will find a whole host of these certified partners, if you will. So it depends on which industry, where in the value system that you see, you will find these answers. So a generic answer will not exist. That's kind of my response to that. Any other perspective? Can we take the next question? Okay, um, I'm Carolina, I'm from Brazil, and I run uh, a social business accelerator in Brazil some years ago. Now I'm running a lab, which is a, for early stage design and prototyping of tech-based initiatives. And I'm very interested to learn more from you. What are the learnings from failures or su successful stories on the mentorship program? Because like every incubator or lab is setting up a mentorship program and it's very challenging. Uh, and you mentioned that here in India, sometimes fail, sometimes not. I would like to hear from you. What are the biggest failures? What are the big, big successful stories? Um, I can take the first pass at that. Um, so you're right, um, and 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 uh, you know we've also seen uh, successes and failures uh, within the mentorship program at the GSBI, and um, you know so so I said that you know our mentors are Silicon Valley execs, been there, done that, but the reality is that not every Silicon Valley exec is going to be a great mentor, and we've learned that over time. And in fact, at this point, you can go to our website and we have our mentor values um, because you know. It, being a mentor is about listening and and working with a social entrepreneur. It can't be just, you know, some some CEO of somebody saying, I know the way and this is my way and you're going to do it my way and that's it. And, you know, to be frank, there's a lot of executives around, running around Silicon Valley that have only one way and it's their way and that's it, right? And it's, so it really can't be that. It needs to be someone who can, like I said, roll up their sleeves, listen, because we don't know the market. We don't know the problems that you're trying to solve. So it's a being about a being empathetic and, and, um, and, you know, and like I said, rolling up our sleeves and working alongside you. Um, and, and you know, the, there's also, you know, to your point about, you know, feeling like it's something you have to do because the company is saying you have to do it. That's not, that's not who we're working with. We're working with people that want to be doing this. I mean, as, as a mentor myself, um, the reason I got involved with this seven year, six years ago was I was having dinner with a friend and said, you know, there's got to be more to life than slinging software. And there's got to be meaning. And he said, well, if you want meaning, you know, go, go look at the GSBI. So, you know, it's coming from a sense of, of wanting to be and doing this. So I think that those are two at least two really big learnings from us. I think one other thing that we've done at Will Grow, which has worked in the mentoring program is uh, a structure of check-ins with the mentor and with the enterprise and between the enterprise and the mentor, mm -hmm. uh, where Will Grow staff kind of monitor mm -hmm. the relationship and make sure that those check-ins are happening regularly and that there's a certain structure to those check-ins. And that has uh, ensured that you know the mentor and the mentee are working closely together and that the relationship is working. So that's a best practice. Mm -hmm. I don't have a... Okay. I, 
it's not really a question, but taking off from what she said, uh, just sort of an experience. I think one of the, as, a, as an early stage entrepreneur, I think when you have investors coming to you, one of the, really one of the key hooks they sell is mentorship. So it's almost becoming like this, like this attractive star feature. And from the outside, uh, as an entrepreneur, there is no way to gauge the quality of the mentorship that might happen at the end of the relationship. So I think that somewhere it almost appears like the power of balance is shifting. You know, for the longest time as an entrepreneur, you would think, where do you get the funds from? But I feel that somewhere the atmosphere is almost becoming like a marketplace and everybody's saying, you know, we'll give you great quality mentorship. And there is actually, there is no system for evaluating as, I mean, as a buyer, of the of the service there is no way for me to evaluate what's going on on the inside so we don't have for instance we don't have reviews uh, so uh, once you get in also so what happens then is that you don't understand therefore what the what the expectations are right you you do understand that they're supposed to walk with you uh, where that have how that goes on and all of that for early stage investors uh, for entrepreneurs I think some education or just some awareness of how to deal with this would be great because you get into a relationship, there's no getting out. I mean, you can then sort of explore multiple relationships like that. But the point is, I think the quality of the mentors is very critical. Uh, it's much more, at least for me, I know that working with a small investor, the amount of money that the investor brings in is much less important than the wisdom and the experience and the, the whole sense of security that a mentor sort of carries. Yeah, in some sense, you know, the first rule for mentors is do no harm. And, you know, mentors should definitely not give bad advice because sometimes, you know, that can, with a startup, completely cause it to crash and burn. It's a serious risk. So I agree. And one, one thing that, and I know, um, you, as you're seeking investments, um, it's not just about getting the money. It is about building, uh, it, uh, entering into a relationship and thinking about it that way and making sure that, you know, that you've got the right people, the right partners is, is critical. And you know, one thing, um, as Guns was mentioning, I mean, we do the same thing, which is, is um, check-ins to make sure that the relationship between the mentor and the mentee are working. And I think it's critical, again, for you as social entrepreneurs to say, you know what, this isn't working for me. And, and, and then and be able to, you know, and, and move on or, you know, change the dynamics or whatever it is. Um, but I think, you know, like I said, you have a voice in this too and, and you can say something about that. So I just split this into two things because since uh, one is the investor and the mentor thing, that's one part of it. Uh, the other is where you have mentoring programs whether it's an incubator or whether it's like you know a GSBI or uh, uh, you know a Dasra program or something, that's a different kind of mentoring, and uh, that's a part where I say is the fact that there has been a lot of successes and failures. It's both both ways that happen. The 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 in the entrepreneurs do not know what to expect, and are they looking for solutions for everything, or are they looking at this as a sounding board? Are they looking for sharing of experiences? You know, there's a there's a disconnect that happens there, and the mentors typically, if they if they come from uh, from uh, you know the the regular corporate space, they've had lots of experience, and they may not necessarily be entrepreneurs themselves. It may always be top down, like you know she mentioned, like a CEO saying, "This is the way that I think that I think it should be done," so that. The, 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 it partly goes to our education system or the, our, our hierarchical society or whatever that you might call it, but it's, it's a lot of top down versus a mentor which could be more necessarily, you know, it could be a learning experience for both. So there it's perhaps, you know, you should perhaps set that expectation in the beginning itself and evaluate what is it that you expect and how would you do that. The investor and that connect is a completely different equation. There you may need to use a different kind of metrics to understand is this the right investor for you? Would they bring in the value that you are expecting? Are you looking at it from a product perspective? Are you looking at it from building out your operations or distributions? And then looking for the right investor who would bring in that value as well. So you may need to look at these two as different and not uh, mix the two up. Thank you. Uh, we've just launched a 300-week entrepreneurship training program. Sorry, my name is Sajju Jain. Uh, the company is Standard Skills. Uh, and we just did this because we found that, you know, 
you train them and you go back to them after a few months and they've basically forgotten all the training you've given them, they're back to firefighting. So we wanted to you know, walk them through the, the entire process of six years. If they, if they start at module one, there are, you, can, you can start in the middle. But I'm really interested to understand what are the common gaps in entrepreneurship knowledge and skill set you've consistently seen across uh, the different entrepreneurs that you've mentored, you've invested in. Uh, what is it, there's a, if, if there's a recurring common pattern that's happening? So, uh, one is that, uh, you know, if you're looking at a problem-solution kind of mindset, so you look at it from the solution perspective, so the entrepreneur knows this is a solution that I see for a problem that I have, you know, that I would want to uh, solve or resolve. But the business part of it is where somewhere, you know, because you're so passionate about the solution that you, you miss out on the business part of it. That's one clear disconnect that we see. And uh, the, the, in the uh, um, space of where you come from, technology, if you look at technology entrepreneurs, it's, in, it's always about, you know, a new technology that comes in, so which could have a nonlinear impact on, uh, on, on the market. So the, the rate of success is much higher, or you know, the, the kind of challenges that they have is different is in, more in terms of how do you take it to the market. In the brick and mortar space, and where we see a lot of these social entrepreneurs who come from, there, there's so much of social, uh, there's a lot of passion that's involved in solving a social problem, that the marketing part of it is, you need to look at it a lot from the existing businesses and see how you can learn from that. And that disconnect is what I see a lot more problem. And that's, what the, that's the space that I look at. So from a technology perspective, you know, I think she might be in a better position to say. From the, from the uh, social perspective, I think that the businesses, their ability to look at the market solution as well is a big disconnect. So, of course, I um, would agree that uh, looking at the business aspects are um, often a gap because that's wh where we focus. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, there is a technology. There's kind of, uh, oftentimes there's a sense of um, that, that customers are just going to do an uptake, right? There's just going to, this miracle is going to happen that they're going to tra you know, transform the way they think about how they light or how they cook or how they, whatever, you know, educate, whatever it is, that there's a miracle that's gonna happen. Of course, won't they want my technology? So oftentimes there's kind of a, a forgetting there. And, you know, whether it's an educational component or trying to figure out a way to, to, to fit in with the, the experience. The behavior change. The behavior the, exactly, change. the behavior change. It, and, and so the other thing that I would, um, would say and is, is um, kind of, an, there's a, a gap in understanding about um, the different kinds of capital that are needed in your in the various uh, phases of of your um, of your enterprise, and um, you know, and what we would say is that um, that equity is not, and oftentimes is not at all the right kind of investment that that you need as social entrepreneurs, but there's just kind of this expectation that that's what you do. And um, so really being clear about the types of capital and, you know, and, and what you need along the different stages of the, of the life cycle of your enterprise is something that um, we need to do a lot of educating of our social entrepreneurs on. Thank you. Uh, can I take this? capital and it becomes a case of you know the movie um, too big to fail I mean is it becoming a situation in the social sector also that it's too good to fail and that we keep incubating and keep incubating particular kinds of uh, you know organizations and, and entrepreneurs that really are not showing success do you have situations like that well, so we have um, so we have an incubator and then an accelerator. Um, so we have two different programs, and and they're focused at different stages again of the life cycle. Where um, our incubators are really focused on people that are organizations that are really ready to do pilot projects and really trying to just get something proven out in a business in a in a uh, in a district or whatever. And then we and we have criteria for entry into that. And then we have our accelerator, which is 
for organizations that have proven out that they've got something here, and now they're ready to move from one district or one state to another to another, and, and the criteria is, is very different on that. So, so you, I, you know, I think that so we've guarded Would there be kind of like a timeline also bind, binding restrictions, or would you look at it only purely from a profile? We, it, it, the timelines are, I mean, who, every, it, every timeline of an uh, on, uh, enterprise is different. <laughs> and so it's not timeline based, it's on capabilities. Um, and we have a capabilities assessment matrix that allows us to kind of look and, and question um, where they are in that and make sure that, because you need, not only do you need different kinds of capital wherever you are, but you also need different kinds of skills. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, early stage, you're thinking about your value proposition, who your target market is, those kinds of things. And later stage in the accelerator, when you're ready to scale, you're thinking about operations and, and things like that. So different, different needs, and, and so we try to address that depending on where you are. But, yeah, so we do see uh, patterns of entrepreneurs who've been through multiple programs and have really not been able to execute, to raise funding. Uh, actually speaking, that becomes a reverse indicator. It's an indicator that this is somebody who actually has not taken the inputs of any of those programs and really applied them to their business. And that's why they just keep going through programs and they go through them almost like automatons and they're not really making the necessary improvements. And that actually is a turn off uh, from a funding perspective because it tells you that this is going to be a difficult entrepreneur to work with. The excitement of being in a program is probably the end of the seeking, not so much the fixing of the business model. We also say that they should not go to a competition. Yeah. And they should stop going to competitions after we invest in them. That's very clear because otherwise it's, they just move from one competition to the other competition and they, they, they're spending time on that rather than focusing on their main business. Jacob, you had a question. Sorry, I'll just come back to you after that. Uh, I'm Jacob. I'm from the Impact Edge Initiative of Industry Foundation. Uh, my question is, is there a place for um, an incubator that is focused in building an ecosystem around a particular sector? So what you are talking about, Bosch, uh, seems to indicate that you can actually create something, say, around the automobile space. Um, and can these incubators then get strategic CSR funding? Uh, from corporates that are interested, that have a, if you could call it that, a vested interest in this space, it also could address to some extent this need to go from competition to competition, because to some extent competitions give grant money. And depending on the life cycle of the enterprise, very often early stage enterprises are too early for equity and they're certainly not ready for debt. and so on which you can classify, but I would not classify, even internally we do not classify that as. But if you take the healthcare space that we are uh, looking at, so certainly I will give you some examples. So for example, we are looking at, again if I take a technology view, we are we are betting heavily for the social space around technologies like pure image processing, pure hyperspectral technologies, right, where you can put multi, multi wavelength light into the human body, if you will, to detect various medical conditions because we think that uh, the way to scale or the way to impact in this market is more non-invasive than invasive and it is more software than hardware the distribution channel is a complex problem so huge amount of our R&D investment is going towards converting things that are in hardware into the software domain so it can be whatever uploaded downloaded if you will that's literally how we are thinking so any incubator that can give us those kinds of capabilities, right, is an obvious uh, straightforward buy for us. So, and then of course the whole big data space, because once you put all this in software, you would analyze this and all that. So if I just take healthcare, we are very clear in our thought. So I can give you a similar paradigm in energy, in food, in water. So at least as a corporate, if there's one corporate you will have who is very clear what medical conditions we will cater to. So it's malaria, it's oral cancer, it's ophthalmology, so we clearly know. And we want startups in that space. So that is where some of the discussions we are having with uh, various incubators is, can you source them for us? And the second is distribution, as we earlier uh, talked about. 
saying that you can somebody take this into the market because as i said in certain spaces we are more comfortable and we think our competence is in making the product we can make absolutely world class product not necessarily distributing it so if there are people who can do that for us we'll be really happy to work with us so it makes sense is that uh, that's what at the beginning I said uh, is that I think if it's part of a strategic the the, the corporate strategic uh, 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 it aligns with the corporate strategy I think it's much better of this chances of success is very high the corporate would also put in all the necessary resources into those ecosystem to make it succeed uh, so we are heavily betting on the fact that corporates would take this up and start building it out and uh, look at uh, you know allied areas or they pick an area which is aligned to the business and try to uh, create an ecosystem of startups in that space so if you have pharma companies for example which are investing into pharma for into uh, pharma uh, uh, into areas which is related healthcare areas or hospitals which are trying to reach out to with either you know it could be telemedicine or other things and try to create that as an ecosystem or you know uh, industrial companies which are like what mr nirankar was saying you know they are trying to build entrepreneurs around this this i think that we would have far better chances of success gentlemen with the glasses here yeah. and then after that we'll take one more after that uh i am shakti i am from the consulting practice of intellicap uh so what i've seen in india there are very few corporates who take uh, incubation as a strategic initiative and since the launch of the new uh, fund which allows corporates now to use csr credits into that it's a very good approach but the past government schemes show that uh, governance is a very big challenge because with every new policy comes uh, gray areas which corporates can abuse and as my colleague said that working capital is a huge issue so just to give you an example uh, like a crystal study says that if corporates pay on time to their existing partners who are SM smes uh, they can raise up to a profit at at least 18 percentage so though there is a good initiative from government's end of uh, you know providing csr credits to the incubation and then developing corporates as a research house and you know motivating their r and d as well but what kind of governance challenges do you see would uh, bring along this policy and what are the steps you think should be taken in those aspects i think very very good question you have asked uh, the major problem today our startup and SMEs are facing is the cash crunch. And uh, here the, I'll give you an example of uh, one government scheme, CGTMS scheme of uh, MSME. How should we fail to disperse it? Despite you have, uh, you say you have 30 million cop SMEs in India. Why the 30 million SMEs has not availed your CGTMS scheme? So there is a lack of willingness from the governance side, which is a key challenge issue. I hope that the next government will, should be more active to reform it. But uh, that is one area. Second is now by corporate by mandatory has to invest. They have no choice. So you will find more investment coming from corporate in the incubation space. And third, which is a new dimension for startups and SMEs, no worry if you fail. No worry if you fail. Soon we are going to start a reward program for failures of entrepreneurs as a supply chain for human resources for corporates. They are looking, corporates will be looking for a field entrepreneurs as a supply chain. So work hard, work, work, and then if you, if you, if you success, you'll be very happy. If you fail, even then the reward is there. Back there. I might sound a little uh, different. Actually, I'm from the government. Uh, I just wanted to ask a few questions like, uh, how do you see government as incubators? Because a government is also a larger social investor. And if, uh, if they have failed, then what are the various changes they need to make in their programs? Because the incubators like IITs or uh, even management institutes today, uh, and how do the market incubators are linking up the social entrepreneurs that they promote or that they mentor with these government programs? Because now we have several uh, skill development programs as well as you know about the National Rural Livelihood Mission where we need to go in scale and we need 
the type of social entrepreneurs here available to link up with these programs. So what are uh, the various challenges or what are the various incubators, present day incubators, trying to do to link up these social entrepreneurs with these programs? Because it's like if we do not link up with these programs, these programs fail and if we are also not getting into it. So I would like to ask the panel this question. Uh, I think certain points you must note down and tell the government to do that. First of all, the government schemes are today are driven by, in this space, by the government officers. And government officers work with a very close mind. Look at your scheme of TEP. How TEP failed in the market. It was only Dr. A.S. Rao was running. He's all in one individual game. You failed TEP scheme for the national interest. What is entrepreneurs looking for government support is the fund, support, grant. And they don't have access. Or even if they access that, they, it kills their time. It takes a long time to reach the right person. That's one. Second, your incubators, which you are running in India with various IITs and NITs and IM Ahmedabad and various IMs. Certain incubators are doing very well. There are about 70 incubators and we are, I'm also on the part of that board. But certain incubators are not doing well because being managed by the wrong person. It's all about hiring a right CEO for the incubator. Yeah. And if a professor is a CEO of an incubator, he cannot run businesses. Mm -hmm. So that correction you have to do. So they should be risk takers. Yeah, risk takers. Yeah. I think the government does have some good schemes. Some of those incubators are doing well. And I think, and Stephanie is, uh, is in the room, I think she's working towards helping capture some of those best practices and share those across and GIZ is funding a lot of that work. So that the ones that are doing well, like the CIIs of this world or the RTBI and IIT Chennai, can spread their best practices to the ones that are not. Generally a pattern that we have seen is where you've got purely academic mentoring, not involving industry, not involving alumni. Those are situations where those enterprises haven't taken off. The technical idea has been developed, but as Rama pointed out, the business idea has not been thought through. And that has resulted in the failure of this. I'll give you an example. IIT Bombay. Bombay, IIT Bombay have a sign. And they have a Vadwani center for also. Look at the difference between the two success rate. So if alumni is are given responsibility to run the incubation, I think it will be most welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, I had a quick question. Uh, if you can hear me, I don't need to use this. I think they're recording also, right. so maybe it might be a good idea. Hi, uh, I'm Amit. I teach uh, on, uh, entrepreneurship and CSR uh, at a college of applied arts and technology in Toronto. I'm fascinated with the space here. Um, I've actually, we've actually set up a center for entrepreneurship in an area of Toronto, which is basically uh, filled with uh, uh, diverse immigrants. And in this center for entrepreneurship, what we, what we try to do, there's a routine amount of, I, mean, I don't know if you know about this, but immigrants in Toronto are the next most vulnerable people after refugees in slipping below the poverty line. Uh, because routinely the credentials are not accepted, systemically. And so therefore we deal with extremely qualified human capital, PhDs, masters, degrees from various parts of the world. They come to us to develop and incubate their own business at the Center for Entrepreneurship. And one of the failings that we see is that at the idea stage, where they clearly articulate and pitch their business, it's, there's lacunae in research. There's lacunae in the proof of concept. What do you see uh, in the Indian space? I mean, I mean are there, because I mean, Sometimes people have tremendous ideas, but they cannot articulate it. And therefore, that is the end of one potential successful venture. And what we try to do in this particular center for entrepreneurship is we bring in industry mentors. Like, let's say if someone has a digital animation idea, we have a successful mentor from the digital animation space. We focus on the SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, who sits down with this person and tries to help hold their hand and articulate their idea. Do you have a similar model in India? I'd be very interested to know. So, so maybe some patterns that we see when we work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs. So one is, of course, I already mentioned about this product reliability quality issue that kind of, uh, you know, we see a lot of times being missed. Second is, I think in India, we do have this sense that since uh, some areas like health, for example, is not as severely regulated, there is compromises. So that is the second pattern uh, that we see. So there is no need to 
yesterday we were discussing they are putting flashes in the eye which you are not supposed to. So the products are out there and they are being awarded but you are not supposed to medically. Right? So it is a complete miss uh, from our uh, standpoint. The third interesting pattern we see with a lot of entrepreneurship, I call it adding inefficiency to an efficient product. So you build, as an example, you would have seen a lot of these. You build a telemedicine product, electronic software product, it does not work in a fixed model, you will put it on a bike with adulterated fuel. Then you realize there is no power. So you will say, I will put a battery. Then you will say, oh, battery will not work, I will put a solar panel to it, right? Look at the number of mechanical parts that you have added to an electronics product. Right? The probability of failure is only increasing over time. You are actually complicating the system. And this is a pattern we have seen across sectors. I mean, this actually, so when you look at that, you feel, oh God, this is so complicated. And you have taken a simple product that you built and completely complicated it. So these are some patterns that we see amongst uh, entrepreneurs. And when we talk to incubators, we say, catch these. Don't make them add the inefficiency, right? If the model is failing, figure out something else. Don't put it on the bike. So to address your question about articulation challenges, I think uh, if you had been in some of the pitches yesterday, I think Suresh and his uh, co-host were making a lot of fun of the entrepreneurs and these are the finalists at the most premier social entrepreneurship gathering in the, probably in the developing world. Uh, so we do have articulation problems, but I think if you have good sophisticated staff and you have a good assessment rubric, that can allow you to get over the lack of articulation skills and still assess an enterprise for whatever it's worth. And then of course, once you accept that enterprise into incubation, you can work on their, uh, the sharpness of their pitch and their articulation skills and so on and so forth. But I think uh, Harish Hande uh, has been crying himself hoarse about the fact that you know, entrepreneurs who cannot speak English do not get a fair opportunity to get their enterprises off the ground. Uh, it is unfortunately the reality of our space and one we should be aware of that we should work actively to overcome because some of those ideas actually might probably be richer because they are coming from people who are in the field, closer to the problem and so on and so forth. So there was a question here, so uh, that gentleman agreed, yes. about incubation and things like that. Earlier when I started off, I, I was trying to stay away from because I had corporate experience and all that. I think I'm loud enough. They're recording. Oh, recording. Okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Venkat. I had a startup called eFarm. It's about five years old. We did get venture funding, blah, blah, blah. After that, uh, typically crash and burn, back to, back to bootstrap. So now I'm rethinking, like, actually, I should have got incubated because Yes, we did have corporate experience, but entrepreneurial experience is completely different. And uh, I would like to use the analogy of a mother and a kid, a baby. Earlier, I was like an orphan boy running around myself, burnt and learned something. But now I do feel that that kind of a motherly, somebody has to mother you for some time. <laughs> so that, that, that it's an affection kind of thing. So now I'm looking for a physical incubation. And uh, actually, very interesting, yesterday the startup wave was there and there was a counter outside. There was a lady who was trying to explain. I was a little aggressive, she was trying to pitch something else and we kind of tipped each other off. So I'm trying to, first of all, apologize to the girl who was there. Maybe I didn't articulate it clearly. I think uh, the, the program is nice because they're trying to take the forms and then push it out to different incubators. And that's great because we don't like filling forms. That's one clear thing. And filling 20, 20 different forms with 20 different, so simplifying certain things is great. But the point where we tipped off is she said it's a virtual incubation program. So this is where I like to say, like, if you have a baby, would you like to put the baby in a virtual incubator and remotely monitor the baby from Skype? Or you say, if the baby has a problem, it uh, calls a call center, any of the mothers anywhere in the world can attend to the baby. That's not what I want, okay? <laughs> so this is where I was tipping off. And then I, she, she said, oh, would you like a virtual boyfriend or a real boyfriend? Then she got very annoyed and then we tipped off. <laughs> so I say, like, hey, we, are, we, we want to come into physical contact because we feel that, just look at us as a young baby. Second, making the baby fill up forms. Are you a male baby or a female baby? Oh, if it's a male, I'll do, do the female, I don't want. When you, mother also wants a baby, right? So you also need us, we also need you. Try to f avoid the initial form filling, just accept the baby. Every baby is born. <laughs> Every, for a mother, every baby is perfect, right? There's no imperfect. Every mother loves a baby, whether it's disabled, whatever it is. Oh, you are a startup. Oh, you are a mobile startup. Oh, you are in that accelerator. This mommy is different. That mommy is different. Moms are all the same. Mom will not differentiate. So I want incubators who treat us like a baby. 
And don't say, after two years, I'm going to push you out and, and the VCs will take care of you. No, no mother would like to, yes, they want to accelerate the baby, make it the best baby. Every mother wants the baby to be the best. But a mother will, even after 42 years, my mother still, what are you doing? Where, where is your mother? So uh, the mother's re boy relationship never, never ends. So I'm just trying to say, take relationship, Take an analogy from nature and try to come. Because here I am finding corporate culture coming in and trying to push you, take equity. Push. Hey, this is different. Incubation is different. Seed, VC, I understand they're all corporate. But relationship between an incubation and an incubatee should be lifelong. This is my humble opinion. I, I'll be glad to see your experiences. But first of all, I'd like to apologize to the lady. A, it's a great platform. I wanted to go and fill in. And then she said, I don't want you. I said, okay. <laughs> You have the <laughs> so I'm not going to comment whether or not I would like a physical boyfriend or a virtual boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> um, so so uh, you bring up a, a, a few points. Um, one is that um, uh, we, we know um, and we hear often, and this is something certainly that we're at, at the GSBI are trying to um, um, uh, resolve is this notion of having to fill out forms and forms and so you you know you apply to one one challenger for one incubator and then you got to do the same forms and, and and such like that and we know that that's an issue and we're trying to address that in a variety of different ways but um, but we acknowledge that and and we're we're trying to be better at that we know that you've got much better time or you know you spend your time much better focused on your business and not filling out forms as far as the relationship is concerned, we agree. I mean, it, it, it can't be, you know, we, we have programs that run, you know, whether it's six months or 10 months, but the reality is that it is, from our perspective, it is a relationship, you know, in perpetuity. And we work with our alumni, um, we do, we, we, and, you know, we're better at it in some places and, and not so good at it, but we want to continue to provide value for you. And you know, part of it is we'll we'll continue to you know to provide what we think is valuable to you in forms of webinars and 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 in meetings and 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 online platforms. But then also, you know, I'm always encouraging our alumni. What else can we be doing for you? And um, we also have started to do ad hoc mentoring. So you know, if you need something, you all of a sudden you get a term sheet. What does that term sheet mean? A lot of social entrepreneurs have no idea how to read a term sheet. Well, we've got a lot of people that can help you with that. So we, we try to keep that uh, relationship going. The, you know, I'm also asking you guys to you know, tell us. You know, and so we can't, we can't just kind of imagine all that you need. So you know, again, engage with us. On the startup rates, yeah. I was on the, <laughs> see, I received 1,269 applications last year. <laughs> 1,240 of them didn't get into my programs. Startup Wave will improve their chances of coming back and getting it. Your analogies, unfortunately, can only go so far. Because if you're in a Jumri Talaya, it's either a virtual boyfriend or no boyfriend at all. <laughs> and so the intention of Startup Wave is to get incubation services, at least for the people who are getting rejected from regular programs in places where they will never get that sort of access or mentoring, to allow them to apply again and improve their chances of getting in. Because that's the only way. I mean, finally, lighting shows social entrepreneurship is really like lighting a candle in a storm. You've really got to nurture every spark. So if there are 1,260 people who bothered to apply to me, each one is a spark. I want each one of them to be a raging flame, which means I want to give them feedback and I want to give them the tools to allow them to come back and apply to not just me, but to Unlimited and to Dasra and to GSBI and to CIA and to everybody else and to get the support the next time round and the third time round. And that's what Startup Wave seems to do. It is not intended to replace incubation, which is going to be required, but it is intended to really focus on those people who are not getting into the programs because they don't know how to think about, they don't know how to articulate their business, and that's what it teaches them to do. One more thing is the, the, the focus on really you know, moving the enterprise through and pushing it out. At the end of the day, the, uh, an incubator should not become like what a tea planter becomes and what he does to the tea bush which is that he keeps it as a bonsai, which means he doesn't kill it and he doesn't let it grow either. And the incubator should not be that. Because we are finally in social entrepreneurship, we are being ruled by the power of the marketplace. Which means if an idea is not working, we should kill it and give that an entrepreneur an opportunity to move on to something else that's likely to work and not just keep it alive forever. And that's why incubators do have you know, this, this desire to prune at some point and make way for the next wave because you cannot just continue uh, you know, to keep things alive which don't need to deserve to be alive.
Okay, we're out of time. We're five minutes over. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you to our panel. Thank you. Very much. I'd like to thank you all for being here and thank the panelists for this super engaging session. Now I'd like to uh, call upon Guns to give the panelists a small token of appreciation. <laughs>